The mountain's waking up. I need time to study it. We're all going to be fine. Simon, how's it going? Good. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Sorry, I'm, I'm late. Oh, no problem. Happened. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I have nowhere to go. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's yeah. cold in Chicago, you know, so I mean, uh, uh, in January, yeah. we're also put inside. Okay. My, my daughter lives in Chicago. She just flew back there yesterday. Really? Do you know yeah. what part in the city or... Yeah, um, well, she used to live, live near Logan Park. Um, oh. She's called West Cortez, is it? Uh, yeah, like the streets, I think, Logan Square, that area. Yeah, I mean, that's where she used to... Let me just... Uh, okay, I can... Um, yeah, it's... Uh, oh, I should know, I've been there many times. Um, well, that's fun. Anyway, it's West Cortez is the way it is. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's yeah, so she, cool. She, she's a musician there. She has a uh she plays um music there oh yeah. that's fantastic a band's called uh, la 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 so she performs locally when, oh, when... she's big in chicago wow okay i will yeah. look her up once things get going uh, you know especially yeah. out here in local yeah, she, hasn't, she hasn't toured for a year now and yeah she spends most of her life touring but uh, uh -huh. but, uh she plays all the venues there yeah but yeah look it up la 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 I will. That's fantastic. Wow. Good to know. He's small world, huh? Yeah. yeah. I love Chicago. There you go. Where are you at? I'm in England. I'm in Oxfordshire, about oh. uh, two hours west of London. How are things out there? Well, it's, I'm okay. I'm out in the country, you know, but we've just gone down into another lockdown. Yeah. Because things have gone really bad again. And, uh, you know, we've got this new variant here, which is 70% more contagious than the first variant. I heard about that. Mm. So, uh, you know, it's, luckily, touch wood, it's not any more, you know, dangerous, but it just it spreads much quicker. So everyone's really locked down now. <laughs> it's terrible. So, yeah. Mm. Well, I guess I won't be seeing the Premier League in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, actually, no, they do play. They play without... I think uh, they played, yeah, a couple of days ago. So that's kind of... Yeah. Yeah, they play without, uh, without a crowd. That's the thing. Yeah. So, well. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully things get back to normal, but hey, in these crazy times, at least you have movies to talk about, so that's always good. Right. Something, something being released, right? Yeah, yeah. Talk so yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've been a longtime fan and admirer of your work. Uh, you know, it, it's so interesting to see how over the years, how uh, the sort of uh, movies you, you've created in a sense and the franchise that came out of it and and to see you now, uh, you know, take new challenges. I was I was kind of blown away by, by this film in, in a sense, uh, literally <laughs> and figuratively uh, how it starts. It's just you have no regard for human life or existence. It's like boom and everything's crashing in the first minute of the film, which I, I love that head start you get into a movie. <laughs> Um, but I was curious uh, that this is pretty much a, a foreign film. I mean, it's subtitled. So um, I'm, I'm curious what drew you into it, because I think that would be a heck of a challenge to kind of movie with this with obviously, um, you know, primarily an, an Asian cast. And, you know, obviously it's subtitled. So uh, English, I mean, there's some English, you know, bits and pieces there, but, uh, tell me what appealed to you about this and, and why did you decide to take on this film? Well, it's by, the, the Chinese part of it is actually quite uh, by accident. I was actually given the script, um, uh, in English and, oh, wow. uh, so I read it, uh, assuming it was an English language, you know, typical Hollywood <coughs> action adventure movie. Totally. It, and, it could be one. Yeah, and so um, I read it with that, and uh, you know, and you start to read and go. Actually, this is a lot of fun. I could have, you know, uh, a, a great time doing this. And as you start inventing scenes, you want to improve and make things bigger and more exciting. And um, and so you sort of get drawn into it. And then after what you know, I find out that it's actually it's intended to be uh, for China, for the mm -hmm. Chinese market. And I go, wow, that's interesting. I go, well, you know, and then you find out it's actually in the Chinese language. And you go, but I, you know, I, a language I don't speak. Right. And, you know, how is that possible? And they, you know, they say, well, you know, it's we want, you know, a Western take on this, and we want it to 
you know, someone who's worked the Hollywood film system to make a, a film for us. And so go, okay, well, you know, most of action adventure is not necessarily about the dialogue anyway. Um, but then when you start getting into it and shooting it, you realize, you know, there is a lot of, uh, about the dialogue. And I mean, luckily the, you know, the, the crew were from all over the world. I had 17 different nationalities because I was shooting on an island in the Pacific. Wow. And so we drew from Australia, New Zealand, you know, uh, as well as LA, UK and China and Malaysia and um, all over the world. So 17 different uh, nationalities on the crew. But so the common language was English. So, you know, the set is very easy to, to deal with because everyone's speaking English. And the cast, although huge actors in China, um, were, were also largely English speaking or bilingual. So I could direct them in English. And um, they are huge in China. You know, they're, they're like, you know, superstars and, um, but unknown to the West. So again, that was kind of in interesting to me to work with these people at the top of their profession in their country but would appear to be completely new, fresh talent to mm. anyone else, you know, watching it. Um, I had Jason Isaacs, who was, you know, English right. actor, we know from uh, Harry Potter and things like that. So I did have, you know, um, a, a central leading character who was English speaking. Um, but after that, it's, it becomes very easy. You know, you, you realize, um, because I obviously know what the lines are, because it's all written in English and the original script is all in English. Mm -hmm. And it's and then it's translated into Chinese for the actors. Um, I just have to have a very good um, creative translator who explains to me, who listens very carefully to the way the actors doing the lines and nuances, the way a director would, and um, tells me what the difference is between the takes. And then even with an English actor, I wouldn't necessarily say, "I'll oh, do it a different way, do it like this." I would just notice the different ways they would do it in four or five takes. And then I choose the way they did it. I like the best. And it's the same in Chinese. So they say this, this take was slightly more, uh, you know, warm and sympathetic. The take before he seemed a little colder and aggressive. How do you want it in the film? You know? And so I can say, well, actually I want him to appear more sympathetic in this moment. So I'll choose that take. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually not as hard as you think. Wow, I'm, I'm sure it's it's a it's a new experience for you too. You know, as a filmmaker who's seen, you know, you've done so much work over the years to at this point in your career get something that you'd never really done technically. That that must be an, an interesting experience for you personally too, as a filmmaker to just in a sense challenge yourself and now be able to say, hey, I pulled it off and I did it. You know, I did something that, you know, initially maybe I would have balked at or, or you know would have never expected. Yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, one of the things when you want, when you get to go to take on a film, it's like, why would I want to put myself through, you know, a year or 18 months of this story, you know, where, if it's something I've done very similar, I mean, it's, it, then it's just like going, you know, to work and really you want to be excited about going. And so if there's a new challenge, um, and in this case, you know, it was the language because, um, you know, th there's always differences in the type of action adventure. I'd never done a disaster movie and I'd never right. done, you know, uh, this kind of film exactly and you say okay how do I handle a volcano you know um and so to me I turned it into a monster movie in my head you say okay the, the volcano is a monster so every time it turns up it has to do something different you know the way that uh, the alien does in you know the spaceship or you know something new about it when it when it does show up so you, you know you've seen the lava in this scene the next one is going to be a pyroclastic flow which is 400 mile an hour burning gas cloud and in the next one it's going to be liquid lava that goes at 50 miles an hour and chases a car so you know then there's air bombs and so it's really I have to research everything I can about a volcano and what they do in real life and on all the different types and say okay we're going to bring all those things into this volcano so that it it uh, gives the audience you know the ultimate volcano experience um, and, and also giving a character to the volcano. Like we, the sound of the volcano is very important. So it's, uh, it's things you might not necessarily notice consciously, but <clears throat> it does make weird sounds when it appears. So we use animal noises. Um, ah. you know, so it's almost like, you know, it's a big bad dinosaur coming and, you know, and the way they create dinosaur noises on movies is just by using slowed down lions and elephants and things that exist now, because no one has a recording of a dinosaur. And you do the same with volcano. Okay, it's not an animal, but it sure is 
can be made to sound as scary as an animal. And then even if you don't no notice it consciously, subconsciously, the primeval human is hearing some scary animal noise and goes, I should be scared of that thing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, you know, that's all fun to do. You know, when I look back at your career and I think about it, you know, it kind of started with Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You uh, that song, um, which I love. And it's crazy how you gotten to be this action guy in a sense where you kind of started out with music videos initially, and I, I believe commercials too. Um, when you look back at kind of your career, which, which has obviously been wildly successful and you've had so many things, did you ever think you'd get to this place uh, and be where you're at right now? And, and this would be kind of you know, the direction that you went in, you know, and, and make these big budget blockbusters, uh, especially at the start of it, when you were doing music videos, which was fantastic. Well, I, would hope, I mean, I think no one aspires to do a Rick Astley video, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's definitely it's a classic. It's a, it's classic. a classic now. It's a classic now. But uh, I mean, at the time, I, I was doing lots of very cool indie band, you know, uh, videos. And this one came along and it was just a, a quick one day shoot. And I thought oh. nothing of it. And then, you know, um, it's lasted 30 years and uh, you can't get away from it. But, you know, I always, I always hoped I'd get to this place. It's only in retrospect, looking back, you realize how unbelievably difficult it would be to get to this place. So that when you're young, you think you can do anything. And you know, you, of course, I'm gonna be a film director, why not? And, um, and although that was one, you know, uh, piece of work at the time there's like many many other pieces of work and and I, and actually when I did commercials all I did was comedy so mm -hmm. when I when I um went into film uh, I deliberately did not choose comedy I was so tired of doing comedy because I did comedy because it had actors in it and dialogue which was great practice but I was so burnt out on comedy I said the, the, I know and I got offered a lot of comedy films for my first film and so I had to decide between these other films I was being offered and Con Air. And I didn't, I'd never intended to do an action film or I didn't watch a lot of action films. I watched all types of films, but it wasn't a genre that I particularly knew anything about. And, um, and I, I, I chose it because it wasn't comedy and, and uh, you know, and had to learn about action filmmaking on the, on the set. I mean, I'd never, oh. I never shot someone punching somebody or someone shooting a gun or anything like that. I mean, I had to learn about it every day, you know, as I did it, you know, really fast. And, um, and then of course, you know, after that you get offered exactly the same thing. I mean, I got offered three or four airplane films after Con Air. <laughs> and you go like, I really, do you think I really want to get back on an airplane and for another 18 months and shoot another airplane film? It's, you know, it's funny how you get pigeonhole but I mean I I in the in the states you wouldn't probably know but I, I some of the commercials I did with the Bud, Budweiser Frogs commercials wow so I did all those and so when I went in to do Con Air I was always talked about as the Budweiser Frogs guy because you know? <laughs> Rick Astley hadn't come back yet there hadn't been any Rick rolling You're right so the only the only thing they uh, could pin on me was um Budweiser Frogs and so that I was the I was the Frogs guy and then, you know, and then when Rick Rolling happened, that's, of course, when it came back. And now everyone's forgotten the Budweiser Frogs. Um, it's that, you know, it's the Rick guy. So, you know, it, it's funny how what captures people's imagination. If you're in one place at a certain time in history and uh, you get to label with that. So, I mean, I, I get, you know, action. But now I think I do have skills in the area because I've learned it over the years. But um to start with, I had no skills in that area. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's those challenges. You know, uh, I, I was going to ask you too, uh, with Con Air being your kind of first feature, like you said, you went from commercials to it. Did you ever anticipate it not only be such a commercial hit, but like it would become kind of like a cult classic that people still talk about today and love? Um, the movie, it kind of it almost had another life of itself uh, in so many over the decades and, and just the way it kind of came out. Did you ever foresee that while making it or just after it came out that would take this life of itself afterwards? No, I mean, I never would have expected it, but I definitely planned uh, hope in the hope that of it being a classic, because to me, I, I like films you can watch more than once. There's, there's some fantastic, brilliant films that have been made over the years, but for whatever reason, you don't 
want to watch them every week or like once a year yeah. but you know when the godfather comes on tv you you sit down and watch it even though you've seen it 20 30 times and and i love films like that and and so i definitely try to make con air timeless and classic so there there wasn't any cgi in it i mean everything is done in camera on it so the cgi can't look old you know mm -hmm. so the technology doesn't get old and then i even style wise i deliberately chose things in it that you couldn't quite pin the time on it. So the airplane was not what they actually fly prisoners around. It wasn't a 737, which is what they really fly them around. I said, I, I want an old plane that looks like a prison bus. So, you know, it's more styled on a prison bus from the 50s than it is from a plane. And even the police cars I chose were not from the 90s. They were from the 70s and 80s because I didn't like the Crown Vicks from the 90s. They're too round and... I didn't like the style. So I actually chose police cars from the decade before. So there's wow. lots of things in there that people wouldn't notice that help make it timeless. So you don't watch it and go, oh, you know, it's uh, this is so of that, you know, that year. I can recognize, you know, what's happening on the TV or the newspapers, what the clothes they're wearing. So I didn't know, you know, I hoped it could be a classic, but you can't plan that stuff. Um, but I definitely tried to make it in a classic way. It's shot on, you know, anamorphic 35 mil film with big old lenses from the 50s it's uh, it's got a lot of retro style elements in it that you again you wouldn't necessarily notice but sub subconsciously they make it timeless and you can watch it over and over no question i guess uh, my final question is kind of a loaded one in a sense you know you've been kind of part of uh obviously you start up in, in a sense the the laura uh, laura croft um tomb raider franchise and we already had a reboot and remake of it so you know you've been in the industry a long time when there's mm -hmm. movies that you start out that being rebooted already mm -hmm. um but in a sense when when you know you make these films um and it comes to this point where you know this you I don't think you've ever done sequels in a sense to some of these films even you've taken on the, the Expendables I think the second part uh, second film um but has that ever appealed to you kind of following up on a franchise that maybe you you got started early on or or you know having a movie in a sense rebooted uh how do you kind of approach that um as a filmmaker um so I guess my question is you know at, at this point um why haven't you uh, in a sense you know, it's kind of like a one movie solo and off, you know, and, and, and not returning, even if it's like a commercial success and, and it's a franchise in a sense. Have you preferred to do it that way or just maybe ironically things didn't align itself um, when it comes to some of these big movies that you've made over the years? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a philosophical objection to a sequel. Um, it just has to be, you know, a very good reason to do it. Um, I mean, in some ways, you know, sometimes I think actually you could do a sequel to one of my films, but uh, because I learned so much on that one about who the character was and and the world, that you have all that knowledge and you work and you worked out what did work with the audience and what didn't, you feel like a bit of an expert in that character in that world, and so you feel like you should make a sequel. So you you know you you learn from you get to put out what everything you learned as a skill. But it's unless it is very different in in it's the same and different. That's the problem. It has to be the same world and the same characters, but it has to be different and new enough for the audience to go, I, I, it was worth you know, doing and it was refreshed. And also when you work out, films are so hard and so long to get made. I mean, some people, you know, you know classic movies can be, you know, when I did The General's Daughter, that script had been being developed at Paramount for nine years before I got it. And then I spent 18 months on it. So it's like 10, 11 years before it hit the screen. <clears throat> and if you work out, how many films you're going to make in your lifetime you know you go uh it, i really want to make as many different ones as possible or you know or things that challenge or interesting and so <clears throat> to use up it's you know it's a big thing to take on a film it's you know you're definitely going to spend a year and a half minimum on it mm -hmm. so and it's often longer do you really want to spend that much time making pretty much the same thing that you just did or you want to try something completely different so it's not i'm against them it's um, I mean, I do think sometimes making two at once is possible, <coughs> you know, so if you've got so much material that you can make two films out of it, you could do mm -hmm. that, but um, that's very rare. I guess safe to say we won't see a Con Air 2, right, at this point? Yeah, I doubt it, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, 
Hey, I I'm proud. One proud moment I wanted to share with you is that uh, I love the mechanic. It was one of my favorite films you've ever done. And uh, I remember always stick with me because it was my first quote when I, I did movie reviews that it was picked up as part of the publicity and promotion. I'm like, that movie will always be special for me because it's like my first marking point that I mattered, you know, in this industry was like, oh my God, my quote got picked up to use for a promotion for the mechanics. So. Well, I'm glad to share that with you. This is one of my favorite films as well. I really like the way that turned out. It's a very, um, I don't know, it's a, dark cool film that and again it was one of those things that as a sequel it would have to be very in you know it'd have to be very different for me to do the sequel of that but mm -hmm. but yeah i'm glad uh, i'm glad you had a, a landmark there with it yeah it was my personal kind of uh, you know a, a young guy starting up in this industry like oh i feel like i've kind of sort of made it you know and it was uh because i liked that film so much so uh yeah, fantastic well, you still got that press clipping somewhere <laughs> i i do yeah of course <laughs> Good, good, good. Well, great. Thank you so much, Simon, for taking the time uh, to talk to me. Like I said, I've, I've been a longtime fan of your films. I, I definitely uh, followed you over the years. And it's cool to see you still venturing off and, and doing a lot of films. Uh, I'm catching up on the recent stuff, Stratton, you know, and all, all these films that you've done in the last few years and uh, looking forward for what's next. So I definitely okay. enjoyed that you even forayed into in this whole new stratosphere of natural disaster movies, too. So, uh, <laughs> Hope to Great. see more. All right. Well, thank you. It's nice to talk to you. Absolutely. Hope to catch right. up down the road. Yep. Take care Stay now. Be safe. Bye-bye.